church, let's stand together and let's worship our Lord. my life like ashes on the waves and leave behind all of my selfish ways my past is gone now all that's left is grace to live is Christ to die is gain I have been crucified with Christ it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. I have a second chance in life. My future's open wide, I know. Christ lives in me. He lives in me. My dreams I live. morning. Christ lives in us. Everything else we can take, as long as we know that. Amen. Good morning. Welcome to those who are here, <clears throat> excuse me, in person, as well as those who are here uh, with us online. We're glad that you have chosen to come and worship with us today. I want to encourage you to look at your virtual bulletin at some point. Uh, it is, can be accessed via that QR code uh, that you see up there or on the, the screen in front of you. And in there, you'll find our Keeping in Touch form, where it gives you a chance to share prayer requests, helps us to know that you were worshiping with us today, and so I encourage you to fill that out. And also in there, you can see information on how to give your tithes and offerings as we give ourselves away uh, to our community and to our world. And so please do check out our, our virtual bulletin at some point in time uh, during the service. I have a couple announcements to highlight this morning. First of all, October is Care to Share Month. Care to Share is our 
annual month-long collection for some ministry partners uh, that we work with in the community. Uh, we're going to be supporting Charlotte Rescue Mission, Community Pregnancy Center of Lake Norman, and Health for Her, which is the new name for what used to be known <clears throat> excuse me, as the Pregnancy Resource Center. So uh, bring in baby items and hygiene items, and you can put them in one of the baskets that you'll find in the foyer, or if you're worshiping at, at home, uh, you can bring that by the church anytime before November 1st, and we'll get those in the hands of folks who really need them uh, through our ministry partners. Uh, secondly, we, I want to call attention to what we're calling Faith in Blue, which is an opportunity to give ourselves away to both our community and our neighborhood, as well as to our police department. And so the police department is going to be out here at the Stonebridge Park. When you say play in the park, it's the Stonebridge Park here. And uh, the police are going to be here, and we're going to invite the community to come, and we need volunteers. And so uh, the ask for Stonebridge is, is for volunteers, and that's our real big need. So if you would come out and help us to be a bridge, pun intended, <laughs> between the police department and the community. And that's on Saturday, October 31st, otherwise known as Halloween, from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And you can go to stonebridge.org slash blue and register, sign up to volunteer for that. So as we go to our call to worship, in a moment after that, we're going to be singing a song called The Battle Belongs by Phil Wickham, and he said that Second Chronicles 20 was the inspiration for this song. And so I thought I'll read a few words from that passage as we prepare our hearts to worship the Lord today. At that time, the Moabites and Ammonites came to wage war against Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, as he stood in the assembly. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And God delivered them. Feels like a battle right now, doesn't it? Out there, no matter where you look, it seems like a battle is going on. Remember, no matter what you are facing today, the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. I want to pray, and the first half of the prayer is going to be the words of King Jehoshaphat from the passage a little bit prior to what I read in Second Chronicles. So let us go before the Lord in prayer as we prepare our hearts. Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. If calamity comes upon us, whether the sword of judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us and save us. For we have no power to face these enemies. We do not know what to do but our eyes are on you. God, like our ancestors, we are here in your presence today and our eyes are on you, which is exactly where you want them. Whether we're facing a pandemic and societal chaos or coming before you in worship this morning, may the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, Lord Jesus, our rock and our redeemer. And all God's people said, amen. Let's stand together. And then 
The lines in that song says that every fear I'll lay at your feet. And I know myself as a parent, one of my greatest fears is how do I prepare my kids to face this wretched world that we all live in? Uh, but I don't need to fear uh, because the instructions are in God's Word. He gives us His Word to be able to train up the next generation. And so I want to read to us some of God's Word right now uh, from one of the Psalms. This is Psalm 78, and uh, hear the Word of the Lord to us. My people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth with a parable. I will utter hidden things, things from of old, things we have heard and known, things our ancestors have told us. We will not hide them from their descendants, we will tell the next generation 
the praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. His power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statutes for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. They would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God and whose spirits were not faithful to him. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are our living head. Teach us to be your body here on earth, your hands, your feet, your eyes, and your compassionate heart. Lord, send the impulses of your love into the sinews of this church. May your will and your thoughts direct us. Let your hands, through our hands, love the next generation well. Let our children hear your voice as we both model and teach them your decrees. Let them come to us and sit in our laps as they sat in yours. Without you as our head, Lord, we are lifeless. We wait for your power, your word, and your instruction this morning. Fill us with your life and your love, Jesus. Amen. Yes, my heart will sing 
reason I sing, the reason I sing, yes, my heart will sing how I love you. tries to roll over my bones when sorrow comes to steal the joy I own when brokenness and pain is all I know oh I won't be shaken I won't be shaken and my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken I won't be shaken
be seated. The scripture this morning is from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Matthew chapter 18. Hear the word of the Lord, first from Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. And from Matthew chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. And he said, Truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This is God's word. Thanks be to God. We are continuing our series and giving ourselves away. And this week we're turning our attention to investing in the next generation. And again, the the heart and prayer behind this series is, is this is become a a motto of our church, giving ourselves away, being a people who give ourselves away. The call then is for us as individuals, where do we feel the the Lord pulling our heart in investing and giving ourselves away? And today I would like us to consider the power of investing in the next generation. Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin. Heavenly Father, as we just sang, there is none above you, none before you. You remain. Your throne remains. All power is yours. All glory is yours. You are the ancient of days, and yet we sang, you know our name. Such powerful and awesome descriptors of who you are, God, and yet the intimacy of a God who knows our name. The intimacy of a throne room where we read in Psalm 84 where even the most common sparrow can find safety and rest before your throne. May your people find rest today before your throne. I pray, Father, that your spirit would continue to sustain the weary, the broken, the downtrodden. May we experience an extra measure of your grace and mercy, and may that in turn pour out, flow out to those around us that we would in turn extend to others the same experience of grace and mercy that we have in you. Father, as we turn to your word, may you train us to live your way. May we be moved by a God who is for us, who gets down on our level and in turn, do the same for others. In your name we pray, amen. Well, in 1994, a new party game was created. Three college students had just watched the movie Footloose, and an old sociology idea from the 30s, the uh, six degrees of separation, they thought, well, I'm curious, how connected is Kevin Bacon? And so this sparked the phenomenon of the game, Six Degrees to Kevin, of Kevin Bacon. And in fact, in 1997, they even made a game of it. And the goal of the game was to name an actor and figure out how closely connected they were to Kevin Bacon. So, so-and-so, well, they were in this movie with so-and-so who was in this movie who happened to be in the same movie as Kevin Bacon. At first, Kevin Bacon hated the game. 
Now he's embraced it and leaned into it and jokes about with people. Now when he meets people, you're one degree from Kevin Bacon. Now, I know what you're thinking, or I think what you should be thinking in this moment is, Tim, such a great way to start off a sermon about the next generation by referencing a game from the 1990s. (laughs) Dated, I know. But in reality, all of us are connected, whether married or unmarried, kids or no kids, by only a few degrees to someone from the next generation. In your spheres of influence, in your circles, there is someone from the next generation. And investing in in someone younger than you doesn't require you to go a great distance to find someone to invest in is right there. And when we as individuals and we as a corporate body, the church, invest in the next generation, we are giving ourselves away. We are sacrificing some things for us for the sake of someone else. And I'd encourage you, students, don't tune me out. This is not just a sermon for mom and dad, for adults. You can give yourself away now. You don't have to be an adult to invest in someone younger than you. Throughout Scripture, we see this call. We see the call to pass on the faith from one generation to the next. And while parents are the primary influencers, we see in Scripture the power of community, the importance of community, the importance of a web surrounding our families. We saw it in Psalm 78 when it was read, Deuteronomy 6. There's power in community. Godly influence through regular presence in the lives of those younger than us. And I would argue that our, our students, our kids need it now more than ever. The season that we're in, the anxiety, the stress, the depression is on the rise in students. And the next generation needs godly influence through regular presence in their lives. In Matthew 18, we see Jesus reorient the disciples, re-aim the disciples completely by taking a child and welcoming this child to the center. In this moment, we see Christ re-aim the disciples' way of thinking, their way of being, to no longer be focused on themselves, but rather outward through humility toward God, leading them toward a welcoming love to the least, to the oft overlooked, to the littlest, through their action and attitude. More of chapter 18 wasn't read, but <clears throat> 5 through 9 get at our action welcoming and guarding, and 10 through 14, get at our attitude. Do not despise the little ones. The reverse of that would be to regard the little ones. Christ does a couple amazing things in this moment that turns the first century world upside down. What we talk about sometimes is the great reversal. First, briefly, the disciples were arguing over the greatness in the kingdom. They were arguing over their place in their kingdom, their prestige in the kingdom, their power, their honor. Who will have it? Who will be a little closer to the head of the table than others? It presupposes a construct of what power is, what greatness even is. And they were applying their view and understanding of greatness to the future kingdom. And Jesus says, don't worry about elevation. Worry about entrance. It's not about your elevation in the kingdom. He says, become like this little child. If you don't, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. They were focused on their tear. He said, worry about getting in the door. And in that, Jesus turns the first century upside down by elevating humility, by taking a child who in the first century was, had no value in and of themselves, And brings them in and says, in their humility, in their vulnerability, in their dependence, that's greatness in this kingdom. In that moment, he does an amazing second thing. He turns around the view of children. That word even there, child, in in Greek, the language is often broken up like other languages, not like English, but in, in masculine and feminine words. 
that word is a neutral word. They referred to children as it. That's the word. That, and he called a little it to him. He elevates something that had no value. The societal little ones. Again, in the ancient world, children, the only value they had was the benefit that they brought to their family. Another child means another person in the workforce. It means a promise of continued glory for the family, for the household, and possibly defensive power. Their value was in what they could one day bring to the family rather than there in this moment as a child. And in this moment, he declares, none of that stuff is what brings them value. They have inherent value in themselves. And as I said, it's a pointing to humility, to vulnerability, to dependence on others that is truly valuable in God's kingdom. And he points to the dependence a child has on others as an example of greatness in the kingdom. So in that moment, Christ is calling us to forget the blinding allure of pride and greatness and rather seek to live in humility towards God that in turn leads to welcoming and guarding and valuing the little ones. Going back to what I said, through action and attitude toward the overlooked, towards the marginalized. In the following verses, <clears throat> six and on, Jesus does make a shift in, in his language using the word child to using a more generic term, the little ones, to speak of those that were marginalized, those that were overlooked. But in verse five, he says it plainly and clearly, when we welcome a child, we welcome Christ. When we welcome a child, we welcome Christ. Christ. This is similar to his call in in Matthew 25. When we welcome the broken, when we welcome the hurting, when we welcome the the lost, the blind, the hungry, we welcome Christ. And this gets at this aspect of our call in giving ourselves away because through humility, as Christ gave, through our action and attitude toward the next generation, we reflect Christ to the next generation. We do what Psalm 78 said. We pass on the truths of who our God is. We see here how Christ calls us to action by calling us to welcome little ones, to guard little ones, and regard little ones with value. Regard is a a term of value, a term of respect, a term of worth, of protective interest. To give ourselves away by investing in the next generation, I think, is looking around our spheres, our circles again, our degrees of separation, and receiving and welcoming and valuing those who often get overlooked. To acknowledge and to receive with kindness those who get looked down on. Verse 10, that word there is, see that you do not despise one of these little ones. That, that's a strong word. I, I don't despise people. But that word really is just to look down on someone. Do I do that? Do I look down on people? In short, we find Jesus calling us to a humbling of ourselves enough to admit our own need of him and our own need of his salvation And then rather than a pursuit of status, rather than a pursuit of greatness, our desire should be centered around being childlike in our trust, in our dependence. And then the call to reflect that to those around us and to those younger than us. In Jesus, we see how we're noticed. We see how we're welcomed. We see how we are known by name, how we're called friend, how we are loved. And the call then is to, in turn, reflect that to others. If he cares for little ones, so should we. He teaches us to despise no one, to grant honor, respect, mercy, regard to all, especially those that are overlooked. 
I think one of the first steps in, in, in doing this is looking around you and acknowledging by name those that are in a different generation than you. Specifically those younger, students and children. I was talking recently with two high school students who shared about a moment when they were taken aback. You can probably all remember moments in, in your past where you were standing with mom and dad and they were talking with other adults and you were just kind of standing there waiting for them to be done and nobody really acknowledged you. And these two students shared about a moment when that other, that other group of adults looked at them, acknowledged them by name, and said hi to them. There was so much power in that moment that they tell the story, they shared the story with me. How much value in regard is shown to someone by simply acknowledging them by name, by making eye contact with them, saying hi. This, this speaks to a welcoming love in its, in its simplest form, and we all know what that has felt like. It requires very little of us, this first step, acknowledge by name those that are around us, to learn the names of children and students within our spheres. And again, students, don't disengage at this moment because you can do the same thing. We all can probably think back to our middle school years, and we would never have expected a high school student to know our name and say our name to us high in public. If anything, in, in middle school, I was Matt's little brother. Students, you can speak value to those younger than you by simply saying hi and acknowledging their name. The call of Christ applies to you as well. Not one day when you're an adult. Now. I've seen the power of a high school student acknowledging middle school students. The legacy of our, of our student leadership team is built upon that. High school students who know middle school students. To welcome someone is to get to know someone. And to get to know someone is to provide belonging. Which is something we all want. We all want to be known. We all want to belong. Whether you're a child or a student, that longing doesn't change. I think a second degree of application drives the investment a little bit deeper through seeking to get to know a student further by getting to know their interests. Getting to know the interests of someone younger than you. Student, by, by, by mentoring, I know that's a scary word, mentoring. I feel like I gotta have all my ducks in a row and I gotta be perfect before I can mentor. Just take an interest in someone younger than you. Wouldn't you want the same? Don't you want somebody to know your interests, to know your hopes, your dreams, your longings? Taking an interest in someone is beginning to walk alongside them. You know, quite a few years ago, we shared a story about someone who did that, Steve Tozier, who passed away this year took an interest in Dave's son, Justin, through golf. And they, they would talk golf, and, and they started playing golf together. And through that, taking an interest in Justin's life spoke value into him. Said, you matter. It illustrates these, these concepts of welcoming, of regarding of speaking value into the lives of the next generation, all the while guarding their value and dignity. Another story I'm, I'm fond of is we had a high school student who was getting to know a middle school student in our student leadership team. This middle school student really enjoyed LARPing. I don't know if you know what LARPing is or not, but it's live action role play. So it's not just rolling dice on a table and using your imagination to role play like Dungeons and Dragons. It's suiting up, making a sword, and going out into a field and beating each other with swords. It's a lot of fun. <clears throat> it lets you get out a lot of uh, frustration. So this high schooler had no clue what this was, but took an interest in this student and learned about it and showed up to play with him. And again, see, as students, you don't have to wait to be an adult to take an interest in someone else. You don't have to be an adult to welcome someone else. 
Over the years, as we've had students apply to our student leadership team, there's they, sophomores to seniors apply, and there's a question that's always asked. It's who, or it's, it's why do you want to be on the team? And it's always wonderful to hear the names of people that they share. They say, I want to be on this team because so-and-so showed up to my soccer game. Students who take an interest in middle school students showing up to games, to recitals, to plays. The power of showing up is huge. And it requires a little bit of our time. But again, the ripple effect of that is massive. It shows so much regard, so much value. And it can be done at any age when the vision is caught to look around your spheres and say, I can show up for that. I can show value to that person. I think this leads to a third degree of investment that I would have you consider. Not only investment in one within your sphere, but investment through regular involvement in the lives of a few through our children's or our student ministry. Yes, there is an ask. Yes, I'm asking you to get involved. But the regular, persistent showing up for a small group speaks value into an age when there is little consistency. When, when so many groups are both broken off into just peers and same age people to regularly, persistently show up and say, you matter to me, not because of what you bring to me, but simply because of who you are. And I'd encourage you, don't believe the little voice that tries to speak in your head, maybe now, I'm too old. I'm not relevant. I'm not cool. I'm all those things, and I've been doing it for a while. Those aspects of you are empty and fleeting. You just simply be present and get to know somebody. Because again, isn't that what you would want? I just want somebody to get to know me, to say hi to me. In, in, in both ministries, we have people of all ages, of all stages, pre-kid, mid-kid, post-kid, single, married. What better way to foster deep community than through a web of believers modeling what it means to follow Christ through every stage and every age of life? And I'll add, don't fall prey to the lie as well that I'm not good with kids. Just think about yourself again. I would love somebody to get to know who I am. I can do that for a kid. I can do that for a student. I can take an interest in someone else. It really doesn't have anything to do with being good with kids. I look at it this way. Whether baby, child, student, you and I have the privilege of being a physical, visible representation of Christ in that moment. We have a physical opportunity to model welcoming love to someone. Again, in a season where we are in alienation and isolation, there's a great need. And to those who volunteer, who serve, who give yourselves away in children's ministry and student ministry, I want to say thank you. It may not always feel like it, but you are a reflection of Christ in that moment. And I'd ask others to consider serving. Student ministry, we've got it up and running on Wednesdays. High school meets from 6.30 to 8. Middle school meets on Sundays from 4.30 to 6. For children's ministry, we're booting that back up again November 1st on Sunday mornings during the second hour. And yes, I say right now only during the second hour because we need more volunteers. We need investors. Join the next gen investment team and model a regard and a value to many who are looked down upon. And even if you still think you're not good with kids, that's okay. Children's Ministry's got jobs for you. They need temperature checks. They need room cleanup, set up, tear down, uh, greeters. 
I just want us to pause for a moment and, and just simply think, reflect. I bet we all, at least a minimum, could think of one person who invested in us, who acknowledged us, who knew our name, who gave themselves for us. And I pray we would consider the same for others. I'll speak selfishly. I want my boys growing up in a community of believers who reflect mercy and grace and forgiveness. To create a web of support around my boys that, that spur them on in the faith. Cheerleaders, a cloud of witnesses that say continue following Christ. To show them welcoming love and regard and to guard and to protect them and ultimately to model trust and dependence upon Christ. And that's the truth that motivates us, that spurs us, that pushes us, that frees us. Christ took an interest in me. Christ modeled perfect humility toward me by laying aside, by leaving the throne, to become like us and to get down on our level. And then in turn, he welcomes us, acknowledges us, calls us friend, knows our name. It's in him that we find life, we find hope, we find purpose, we find belonging. And as you and I look to him and we find our value, May we in turn speak that same value into those around us, but even more into the next generation. I pray we would point others to him and speak value into the lives of others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for taking an interest in me, in us. Thank you for your grace and mercy. How in the incarnation of Christ, we find a welcoming love. We find redemption. We find whose we are. The value that you have declared over us. You, God, are the only one who can truly fill us, who can truly provide value, who can sustain us. May we live into the light of that. And may we reflect that to the next generation. Father, I pray for the next generation. I pray you would spark in them a longing to see that it is only in you that we find our belonging. It is only in you that we find our value. May we as a church be a place of dependence, of trust, of vulnerability. May we be honest with our brokenness. Honest with our faults. And Lord, so often we fall prey to the lie that we have to mask them and hide them. That you couldn't love me, you couldn't value me if you saw them. Father, that lie destroys us. You've seen them, you know them, and you still call me friend. I pray, Lord, that that same power, that same truth, would pass on from one generation to the next. That you are a God of the generations. And the promise you've laid upon me was because you did it to generations past and you will continue. And Father, as we sing, there is nothing better than you. May we believe it. May it sink deep into our hearts. And may we point the next generation to that truth name we pray. Amen. Now every day
desire is now satisfied I hear in your love Oh, there's nothing better than you There's nothing better than you, Lord There's nothing, nothing is better church and I'm not afraid to show you my weakness my failures and flaws Lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend yeah cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley Nothing better than him. Don't we want the next generation to know that now? Rather than to go seeking elsewhere to find things that are better and to realize there's nothing better than him. The power of value, the power of acknowledging, the power of investing is to point people to him. Say, that's where you're going to find true belonging. 
this is your first time with us, we're really glad that you're here. Welcome. Uh, on your way out as you give your tithes and offerings here or online, however you give your tithes and offering, I encourage you, take a moment and pause and thank God for the investment he's made in you as you then in turn give to the local body to do the same. If you're in need of prayer, uh, I'll be up front. Other pastors are around, people who are willing to pray with you. Receive the Lord's blessing as you go. May the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, may he equip you with everything good, working in you that which is pleasing in his sight. And all God's children said, amen. <laughs>